woman is out there spreading a truly remarkable idea and message. And it is this, that for women, really the seat of our power comes from living in our pleasure. And that idea is an idea whose time has come. Yeah. yeah. This woman has been out there spreading this message with such boldness and devotion for years. She has touched the lives of countless women who have gone on to live this idea in their life and spread it to other women. This world is a better place because of this woman. I have personally been so impacted by her work. In 2006, I took the very last Mama 101 course. I was one of the first big sister goddesses in her mastery program and watched my life completely transform in the most ma magical, powerful ways. I, I absolutely know that her teachings of bringing more pleasure and fun with devotion into my life and celebrating the women in my life, practices of gratitude, these things have opened my life in ways that I could never have imagined in so many of the lives of women that I see out there. This is a woman whose idea that I will support to the ends of the earth in getting out there in ever more far-reaching ways. It is my great honor to present to you the first ever Woman Thought Leader of the Year, Regina Thomas Hauer. <laughs> until you were done speaking, but why don't you make sure you can see it. It's fucking stunning. <laughs> oh, I'm so honored. Oh my yeah, goodness, you thank you so much, Casey. I'm oh. so thrilled to be here. And I'm, I, I'm blown away by what you have created and what you've inspired mm -hmm. in those women. It was outstanding. I'm so grateful to have been here for every single one of the talks. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Did great. You know, I realize there's something very important that, for those of you who don't know, uh, that I did not say, and that is that Regina is the founder of this epic school called Mama Gina School of Womanly Arts. Yeah. <laughs> and I have so many sister goddesses in the house, so delighted! That's it, sir, I'm in the house! Because yeah. sisters turn out for sisters. That's what sisters do. <laughs> and really, before I start, forgive me, I didn't warn you. There should be a warning sign plastered right on me that says, a little vulgar, curses like a tr truck driver, wears designer clothes, very sacred, very saucy, very sexy, very hot, very deep, very wide, very delicious, very outrageous, will offend as profoundly as she will charm. <laughs> Basically, just like you. <laughs> this is the recipe of who and what a woman is. So that's me. Please forgive the fuck before we even said hello. <laughs> it 
can't get worse than that, right? <laughs> All right, where were we? And that is what a thought leader does, <laughs> totally. Where we were, was to, I want to really, these women to, I really want people to know about what it is that you have been up to in terms of getting your voice out there and what that's been like for you. I mean, this woman has written books. She gets out there and speaks. She is out there with her message. So a few questions. I want to know, tell us, what was the first time that you ever got out there and spoke to people? All right. I'm going to tell you everything. The only thing I ask is that you use my story to open yours, mm -hmm. okay? Because mm -hmm. that's why I came. Because I thought this is my moment to get my hands on a brand new set of sisters to turn on in an even deeper way to living every delicious, outrageous, incredible dr drop of the sensual being that you are in the world. And as women, we don't get much encouragement to do that. So where I very first started was, um, I was, uh, like the first time I spoke, spoke. Yeah. Because I didn't really speak, speak, like the way you were speaking today. It's not like I sort of took the stage and got a mic and went, yeah, 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 yeah. It was way grassy rootsy. Way grassy, way rootsy. <laughs> <laughs> and what I was doing was I was a, a, a person who was a, a researcher, first and foremost, like all of you, and researching, like, how could I make my way in the world as a woman where I felt so disenfranchised and so devastated by a culture that doesn't uh, know who and what a woman is or how to honor a woman or even how to make space for a woman to exist. I mean, uh, the military, hello, it's not all that different from the world, you know, where a woman is squelched and scrunched and stuffed into a man suit, and we're asked to live lives that aren't really uniquely feminine. So I always felt like scrunched and stuffed and forced, and I was irate about this, and I was sort of a secret warrior, like a guerrilla pleasure warrior. <laughs> And so what I did was I sort of went to all these alternative programs looking for something that made sense because nothing I saw made sense. And I knew, my father was a Freudian psychotherapist, so I knew enough to know that therapy was not going to work out for me. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, we learned so much from our family of origin, and my, my family's hobby was studying problems. And what I found from <laughs> <laughs> was that it made my problems grow. And then I knew where my problems came from, and I knew why I had my problems, and they even were even more bigger. In fact, they were immobilizing to me. Like, I was immobilized. I think every, uh, I hope, has anyone ever felt immobilized? Mm. Okay, this is so good, because that is your genius. Whatever binds you, and you feel like you cannot even break loose, that is your genius grabbing you by your ovaries and saying, baby, don't take a step further until you do a reckoning. And so I want you to like worship at the shrine that stops you in your tracks because that is the beginning of the leader that you were born to be in this world. As Casey has said time and time again this evening, every one of you here is a leader and the voice and the, your voice is required on this planet. So I was thinking, since it wasn't going to be about problems, because I knew that my problems weren't sourcing a passionate, exquisite, delicious, ecstatic, beautiful, brilliant life, they were actually slamming me into a 10-year, um, I was a hermit for 10 years. <laughs> I was trying to study my way out of the, uh, the world that I was inhabiting, I didn't know, I knew I couldn't take a step forward until I understood who and what I was as a woman. Mm. And every woman around me I saw dimming her light rather than expanding it. And I wanted to know what that was and I wanted to know how to solve it in my lifetime. I've been on this mission since I was quite small, I'm sure each of you can relate to that, where you awaken to something as a child that keeps burning you as you grow. So 
uh, what I did was I studied with all these different wacky, outrageous teachers. I found this collection of hippies in California that were doing the best, most incredible work in sensuality mm. and pleasure. And they had this uh, little group in New York City called Moore University. And so I brought these teachers to New York so that my friends could study with them. And the, the classes were crazy and eccentric and wild. And then, uh, and so I kept bringing them to New York. And then finally, a friend of mine and said to me, you know, at this point, Regina, you should put on a class yourself. And he mm. put five people in his living room, pushed me out, and I was on a roll. I was like, yes, I'm home. Yes, 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 I'm home. <laughs> That, you know, I didn't find my way right away because a person doesn't find their way right away. You go trippingly along, you know, smacking into things, like, <laughs> right? And you just are so foolish and it's so fun to be insanely mistaking, making huge mistakes. So, but um, what, <laughs> what brought me great clarity was when I gave birth to my daughter. Mm. Birth wakes a woman up. <laughs> Who's had a baby? <laughs> Right? I mean, I, really, I owe my greatness to my daughter. Like, I would never have stepped into the woman I am today. If I, I really encourage you, if you even have an itch, just have a baby. I, although, you, you, <laughs> <laughs> when you say it's so transformative, <laughs> I mean, it's wretchedly hard. <laughs> but it's so, um, it brought a part of my soul into existence because of the way in which I loved my daughter. And I knew I had a great sense of responsibility. First, great gratitude to my ancestresses, the women who made me possible. And then I knew that uh, I had a great responsibility to the girls of today, the women of tomorrow, and what was I doing with this life mm. to ensure that the world could handle who and what a woman is. Because the world has no clue who and what a woman is. And women, worse, still have no clue. And so I knew that my spot was to awaken the women to themselves. P.S. Hello, I needed to awaken myself to myself. We always teach what we need to learn the most. Mm -hmm. So there I was, and I was sitting there nursing the little thing. <laughs> God, that hurts! I can't even believe how much it hurts! No one tells you. you oh. It's like... <laughs> Just for the first six weeks, and then it turns into bliss. All right, but this was early, so I'm watching TV. And Dangerous Beauty comes on, best movie oh, of all time. I love that movie. I'm nursing her, Dangerous Beauty. And this woman uh, is a courtesan, and she says to her daughter, who she's teaching to be a courtesan, she says these immortal words. If you want to give pleasure, if you want to give pleasure, you must know pleasure. Mm. And I was like, <gasps> that's the whole Right there, women haven't been taught about our pleasure. We've been taught how to take care of other people, how to take care of our families, take care of our bosses, make life, life great for everyone. Like you were talking about like how stunning you were at organizing mm -hmm. other people's brilliance, because that's what women were taught to do. We were taught to like be in service to, be in service to, and no one teach it, was teaching us how to, what about our pleasure? And I thought, well, oh, that's what I got to do then. I've got to start an academy, a courtesan academy. <laughs> Bring back the womanly arts of the courtesan. And I thought, womanly arts, womanly arts. And I'm a mama now. Look, there's the baby. I, I'm nursing it. I'm doing this for her. I will start Mama Gina School of Womanly Arts. I just had no idea it was going to stick. Wow. Like, here it is. She's 15 now. And, and people still call me Mama Gina. <laughs> and I love it. And it's taken on the meaning that it always has. You know, sometimes you step into something and it's just the right thing. And then, as you say, as soon as you step into that path, that stream, mm -hmm. you've noticed all this huge shooting power. It's almost like the showers totally. of grace are like swirling all around you. You can do no wrong. <laughs> the well-spoken woman is here in New York City. It's in the West Coast, East Coast. It's everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> That's not just Casey, that's not just me, that's every single woman when she steps into the risk of her voice in the world. 
So there I was, I'm teaching the School of Womanly Arts, right? I don't know how to like, it's New York City. Celebrities hunt me down. And the next thing I know, I'm like in Vanity Fair and then it's the cover of the style section, Sunday Times, and then it's 12 book deals. Now, I'd known my whole life I was a writer because I've been keeping journals, you know. Can't even imagine the stacks of journals that I have, right? But I never had anything to say mm. until it was time, right? So mm. that there's a day wh where the page gets turned. So then I had one book, two book, three books. I, I have done the Today Show zillions of times, Conan O'Brien, Rachel Ray, 2020, I had two specials on 2020. Like, the world says yes when a woman says yes. The world says yes when a woman says yes. Says yes, says yes, says yes, says yes. <laughs> That's a tweetable. Is total, total tweetable? tweetable. Okay, we finally got a tweetable. That's tweetable that we know, now know is a tweetable. Okay. Anyway, did I answer your question? <laughs> yes. Well, I, I have another, another one. Because I know that having said this, there are so many women here who are going into the next echelon of what it is that they have to birth with their voice in the world. So mm -hmm. do, do you ever feel fear? Have you, did you ever feel it when you started? And if so, mm. how, did you, mm. how, what did, how did you get right with it? How mm. did you? That's a great it question. Um, my commitment was so much stronger than my fear. Mm. <laughs> I want to, I'm so passionate about women. I'm so passionate about what the, the creatrix called woman can bring to this world. The solution is in a woman. You, you know, this world, the world we live in is desperate for new ideas. It is hungry, it is desperate, it is the patriarchy is collapsing all around us. And it is not gonna, it's not gonna happen through the guys. Where all life begins, where's all life begins, sisters? Hello, hello. Whether you use this body to spit out a baby or not, you are a creatrix. You create every single time you enter a room, you take everyone higher, you see. You see what's required, you see what's missing, you know how, how to elevate, you know how to enhance, you know how to make it great for everyone in the vicinity and then some. And the only missing piece for a woman is tapping into the truth of her passion, which and her voice, which lives in only one neighborhood, her desires. Mm. And the food of her desire is the one missing elixir, the one missing element that we have been taught to banish from our diet, which is pleasure. Mm. Pleasure is pleasure. And so every single focus of every single moment of my day is to bring and heighten, first of all, the pleasure in my own life. It's been so exhausting doing all this research for you. <laughs> but for you, sisters, I go on. <laughs> and, uh, but my, my commitment is to women and to, you know, igniting because I, I, I um, women, our lights are off. You know, if, I, if this was a room full of three-year-olds, you'd be giggling and poking each other and chatting and kicking your little toesies up and dancing and going crazy. And, and as a woman gets older, her light gets dimmer and dimmer and dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. And I won't fucking have that. I will not 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 have that. I will do whatever the fuck it takes to turn women on. That's my mission. Woo! Yeah! So I get scared all the time, but my passion's bigger than my fear, mm -hmm. and so that's what pushes me forward. Wow. Is there a moment, is there ever a moment where you're like, okay, I'm gonna choose to do this anyways, or is there, mm -hmm. is there what is that, is there a moment inside? Yeah, the, the place that, um, like, for example, I, I was thinking about this when we were in the dressing room over there, because I remember uh, the, at, it's places of great growth for myself, like a growth edge, where I, you know, um, there were 500 women who came to graduation at my mastery class this time. Wow. Like, like 500 women, 500, like I started this in my living room, people. It's like sisters, it was like a little 
gang of us, like little 12 of us. In my living room, and there was 500 women who were longing, who were longing to live their passion. They were longing to live their desires. They were intolerant of the mediocrity. They were intolerant of that sense of disenfranchisement, of that sense of despair, that sense of depression, that sense of alienation that women have grown accustomed to. It's a time of such global awakening, as you know. That's what put you in these seats tonight. So to see that, that many, like that it had happened, and I sort of looked out on that, and I was like, holy fucking shit. Great pussy in the sky. <laughs> <laughs> and then everything was okay. Because I was wearing this really cute dress. <laughs> I find that fashion helps fear. <laughs> That's a tweetable probably also. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> um, it was fringe, gold fringe everywhere. I looked so hot in it that when I started to move down the stage, I was like, oh, yeah, I got this one. <laughs> Madison Square Garden next. <laughs> but yeah, there's always a moment. There's always a moment. But I think the, that moment is like, it's, you know, even if you're standing still and it's hot and it's humid, you can feel the wind in your hair you know, uh, because you are stepping into a new part of yourself that wants to be stepped into. Uh, I draw a lot of inspiration from leaders. Mm. Which leaders? I'm re I just came back from Tanzania. That's how they say it there. <laughs> Aren't I cool? <laughs> <laughs> we call it Tanzania, but they say Tanzania. And they correct you. Um, hi, it's so nice to be in Tanzania. No, it's Tanzania. We are in Tanzania. So I was just there. And then I went to, um, Zanzibar. <laughs> well, I was there doing it with my daughter, who's now 15. We were doing service work at this school. Oh my goodness! We built a class. We we built a kitchen and we put running water in it. It was my first kitchen, um, and uh, <laughs> we painted a bunch of classrooms and we built a gate. And it serves 850 kids. About 30 percent are orphaned due to the AIDS virus, which, which is rampant. Which, P.S. Hello, if women had their voice, would that AIDS virus be fucking rampant in Tanzania? No, people, I promise you it would not because if the women had their voice, they would be like, do not come near me, motherfucker, with that inf infected cock of yours. You put that shit away. <laughs> but when a woman does not have her voice, she just lies there and lets that happen to her. And then she passes that to her children and her children's children. There's 30, 30 you know, 30% of this school is orphaned. It's, it's, it's time, sisters. It is time to awaken. And you know what? Every time you awaken, you awaken another woman on this planet, and we are all connected that way. Okay, so, Later. Tanzania, Later. Huh? Leaders. Oh, yeah. Good. There I am. <laughs> and um, in Zanzibar, there used to be a slave market. This went on for a really, really, really long time. And it didn't stop until 1873, where, when there's this guy, Dr. Livingston, remember him? Doctor, that remind me. Like Livingston, he was this big explorer in Africa. He came from England, he went over there, and, the, and they lost him for many years, and then some other explorer went and found him, and they said, Dr. Livingston, I presume? <laughs> oh, in the that of Africa, I remember that, guy. that line. All right, so <laughs> anyway, so I found out that that one guy he put a stop to the slave trade in Zanzibar, mm. where there were thousands and thousands and thousands of lives lost every day to, to slavery and to the slave trade, because he saw it and he thought, this is wrong, and I'm gonna go back to England, which had abolished slavery 40 years before in the British colonies. We had only abolished it in 1863. They abolished it in 1833. And, uh, and it was him, all by himself, that saw that and thought, we ha this has got to change. And he went back to Parliament and got backing. And he went back, and within uh, a year or two, he got everybody in agreement. He got the s Sultan of Zanzibar. And the, the slave uh, g gallows were closed, and the trade was stopped. Wow. And I thought, that is, that is a lot of power. One white guy in an African country could do that. Shit, motherfucker, I could do anything. <laughs> So, he inspired me recently. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
So if there was one thing that you could say to, in addition to, but one thing that you could say to these women, if there's women who are on the feeling on mm -hmm. the cusp of yeah. the next evolution, the next, the next evolution of their voice and their <coughs> wisdom and what they have to say, what do you got to say to them? Uh, baby step, sisters. Mm -hmm. It's all about the baby step. Um, I created my school one woman at a time. One woman told another woman who told another woman who told another woman who told another woman. It's not about that you suddenly have to conquer internet marketing. It's not about that you, you, you need to uh, have thousands of people in front of you before you can give your first speech. It's about having the privilege of living your truth and living your voice because you can change someone's life by just being that that you were that you are and every single day is an opportunity to become more and more and more the woman that has always been your destiny to be if you give her permission to take you over and have her way with you <laughs> so that would be my advice is just baby steps just one more little step in the direction of that which ignites you and fills you with your own passion. And just a little step towards that and a little step towards that and it snowballs. And then you, will, you, then you will become a human stick of dynamite and create explosions wherever you go. And that is a happy thing. <laughs> Regina Thomas Howard, woman thought leader of the year.